Good morning, everyone. I want to start us off just by doing a little bit of a semantic um, reset here, because we often talk about what we're discussing today as the liberal arts. But we all know what we're really talking about is the liberal arts and sciences and the social sciences. Too often, our types of institutions are viewed as being orthogonal to producing leaders in the STEM field and orthogonal to um, what we would call the hard sciences. And of course, that's not the case. Um, students at our institutions um, are sometimes, sometimes those disciplines are overrepresented in terms of the population in our institutions. So that's one of the reasons that we have Bill here is to talk about the richness of the STEM fields in the liberal arts. I also um, mused a little bit on why me? Um, I'm a university president, small liberal arts university. Uh, Bill is a renowned neuroscientist. Why am I the one interviewing him? And when I reflected on that, I realized, well, actually, he was a physics major as an undergrad. I was a psychology major as an undergrad in the, the um, more scientific, hard science side of psychology. And we both started out as researchers on the brain. Um, somewhere along the way, I learned to change light bulbs pretty well. And now I'm a university president. And at, at some point, um, Bill found that this was really his calling to um, discover things that are really on the frontier of science. But the point is, our, um, our backgrounds, our early backgrounds, and what we began to think we might do was fairly similar. Yet our liberal arts education gave us the opportunity to, to take the directions that most suited us over time. And so I want to start um, by talking with Bill about when he was in high school. When he and I had a chance to talk on the phone, he told me that when he was in high school, he knew that he wanted to become a PhD scientist. So I want to start with hearing a little bit about why you then chose to go to Stetson University for a physics undergraduate degree. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I had had the good fortune. I came from a small town in Podunk County in North Florida, so I don't come from a sophisticated background at all. But I um, had the good fortune to be uh, admitted to a summer research program at the University of Florida after my junior year of high school. And I went there, and I was all set to go to the University of Florida as, a, as an undergrad, you know, be, be admitted there. Uh, but some friends of mine, my senior year in high school, were going down to look at this little college, Stetson, 50 miles south down the road, and wanted me to come. And I said, OK, it'll get me out of a day of high school, so I'll go down. And you know, it's the worst place to spend a day. <clears throat> the director of admissions at Stetson got me right over to see the chairman of the physics department who immediately took me to a classroom. And there was a class going on. He said, this will be your your freshman physics class as a science major. And there were 17, 18 people in there being taught by a professor. And he said, if you go to the University of Florida, that class will be 400 people, not 17 people. And he took me over the next hour around to the offices of the individual faculty members uh, and introduced me to them personally. Uh, they were all very warm people. And he said to me in the hallway, he said, if you come to Stetson, the development of your mind will be the primary focus of their mind. Uh, and this was sounding pretty good to me. Uh, I, I, I had one more question for you. I said, I want to go to graduate school. I want to get a PhD. I don't know in what field yet, but I want to get a PhD. Do your graduates get that opportunity? And he, his face lit up like Christmas tree. He took me into his office and he had a little notebook, press clippings, you know, where Stetson physics majors had been admitted to Caltech or to Columbia or the University of North Carolina. And by the end of the day, I was convinced. And I went home and told my parents, you know, I think I'm not going to the University of Florida after all. <laughs> but Bill, I think I then said to you, well, you must have engaged in undergraduate research while at Stetson, because uh, undergraduate research is one of my loves. We have a representative from the Council on Undergraduate Research here. And you told me something that really surprised me. You said, you know, the equivalent of, well, back in the day, we didn't do that. We didn't have undergraduate research. And, you know, clearly, you made it anyway. You were able to get along well without that. But you, um, you meet a lot of young researchers, I'm sure, postdocs, who came up through the liberal arts college route before their PhD, like you did. Can you talk about the role of undergraduate research and what you've seen uh, changing in our, in our field? Yeah, it's extremely important. I sit on admissions committees at Stanford. I've been there for 28 years now. Um, and 
I had some dabbling, I would say, in research when I was at Stetson. You know, we didn't have that much equipment, and there wasn't that much of a focus. When I go back to Stetson now, it's just a changed landscape. The research opportunities are definitely there, and faculty are evaluated as much on research. I mean, teaching is still their primary thing, but they're they're evaluated and promoted on the basis of research also. And I think that's happened at a lot of liberal arts colleges over, over the course of four decades. And I think this is extremely important because uh, classroom learning about science and research production of science are two very different things. And one of the things we really look for in admissions at Stanford is people who, who have experience in both because uh, the process of creating new knowledge and flailing around with broken equipment and making it work, you know, for that one little time when the experiment goes right and you see something new for the first time. Uh, not all students, even if they're interested in science, not all students like that process. And if they come into grad school and discover they don't like that process, then they've they've probably wasted some time and we've wasted a grad slot. So I think I think that the developing the research component is really important at, at liberal arts colleges. And of course the best ones always have. I mean, you know, Oberlin has produced tremendous numbers of neuroscientists. Reed College has been doing this for a long time. But uh, it, more and more places like Stetson have high quality research as well. Yeah, I would think um, from my travels in higher education and the colleagues I know, the institutions I know, um, in the past 15 or 20 years, it's gone from being something that was unique and special to being de rigueur at our institutions. And I think there's probably not one at this point who doesn't do it to some extent, particularly in the natural sciences. but other disciplines. Um, I, I started out by pointing out that our, our colleges and universities are not only institutions of the liberal arts, but the arts and the sciences and the humanities and uh, the social sciences. And so you came up through that type of education when you were a physics major at Stetson. And I'm fairly certain that you took courses in a wide variety of disciplines. And now you find yourself in a, a very interdisciplinary field. Um, and so you're in a field where chemistry, physics, biology, neurobiology, psychology, philosophy, all impinge on it. Can you talk a little bit about your orientation toward disciplinarity and any of the strengths that um, had their seminal roots in? Yeah. When I was at Stetson, I felt like the whole university was my playground. You know, I wouldn't have said it that way at the time, but looking back, that's the way it was. I took uh, numerous religion and philosophy courses because I'd been raised in that kind of culture in the South, and I was really interested in how my experience, you know, in a church pew or something related to my experience in a laboratory. And, you know, I was constantly trying to put those ideas together in my own head. I took a senior level uh, Shakespeare course uh, during my senior year in, in college. And I took psychology courses. And uh, I really, to my chairman's disappointment in physics, I graduated with just the bare minimum number of courses required for the physics major because I had sort of decided I wanted to go into biology. And I started taking biology and chemistry courses. So really, I was a general science major with a healthy dose of the general university. And I, I do think that that has served me extremely well. I mean, if I have one regret about my curriculum, it's that's not, I, I, if I could go back and change one thing, I would have taken more math uh, because you know neuroscience is becoming more quantitative. The data sets are becoming more complex. The advanced statistics and uh, analytic tools we have to bring to bear on the data sets are so sophisticated. I you know, I, and I advise Stanford undergraduates this all the time. By the way, when they tell me they're really interested in the brain and want to study the brain, uh, get your probability theory, your statistics, and get the linear algebra. Get the math. If you'll never regret it. I want to probe a little bit more about the, uh, the example that you illustrated because I learned by uh, spending some time on YouTube and Googling you that you've spoken about um, the intersection between free will and science and you often speak on the juncture between humanities, religion, and science and their compatibility. And that's not particularly what this symposium is about, but I think your willingness to explore those issues, as you said, dates back to your liberal arts days. Yeah, it absolutely does. And I think, you know, the, the Stetson faculty really helped me develop some fairly sophisticated views on topics like that. You know, took, took this little almost country boy out of North Florida and, you know, smart, curious, but, you know, 
I, I think Gregory used the world, uh, used, used the phrase, pull the blankets back on the world, or pull the covers back on the world. And they introduced me to a level of learning and thinking about these topics that was really very nuanced in retrospect and sophisticated. And they have formed the, ba the boundary of the foundations for a lot of the thinking that I've done in years since then. Um, so one of the real concrete outputs of that is, is that I'm a different kind of biologist for most biologists. Most biologists today, we take things apart, and you know, take something complex like an organism, and we take them apart in smaller and smaller pieces, uh, looking for the mechanisms that underlie some visible behavior. Uh, and when we take it apart in small and smaller pieces, and we understand the synapse, or we understand DNA, or we understand you know, whatever, smaller thing, we feel like we, un we, un we have understood the whole thing. And it's a kind of reductionism. And I'm committed to reductionist techniques in the laboratory, but I'm, I'm not committed to reductionism as an ideology. I think that taking anything like an organism, uh, there are multiple levels of organization. Each of those levels of organization is essential to understanding what that organism is about. And I'm not a, a fundamentalist. But many biologists are fundamentalists, and it just depends on what they love, what they regard fundamental. There are genetics fundamentalists. There are neural circuit fundamentalists. There are areas of brain fundamentalists. That's where the fundamental level of explanation really lies. But I think that is, that's, that's, that's a naive view of com complex systems. And I think it's poor philosophy. And in the end, it can lead to poor science. And so I, I feel like you know, what germinated in me 45 years ago or 40 years ago, uh, Stetson has, has borne fruit in the style of professional that I am. Do you have uh, students or colleagues who challenge you on your ability to transcend those barriers between, let's just say, loosely empiricism and humanism, or are you so convincing that? <laughs> <laughs> no, they certainly challenge me. I'm a curiosity, right? They, it's interesting. Uh, they have enough respect for the science that I do. I, I have a track record. And they have enough respect that I'm kind of a curiosity for them that they want to know more about. And some of them are quite congenial with my way of thinking on, on, on certain things, how we should view organisms and nervous systems and where do the real causal cranks lie. And some of them are merely puzzled. And what seems blindingly obvious to me, they just kind of shake their heads at the end and wander off. They argue with me a little <laughs> while and then wander off. And so he's, kind of, he's a good guy, but he has strange ideas. <laughs> I, I think. Uh, you exemplify what, what the world needs in terms of a scientist. And, and by that, I mean you're, you're on the frontier of science. You're on the frontier of new discoveries that are going to have untold impacts on, on the world. And uh, I Googled brain and new frontier. Uh, I got, because the, those words, new frontier, was bandied about a lot on President Obama's um, brain initiative. And you served as the co-chair of the NIH working group that um, actually fostered that dialogue. So I Googled those two things together and I got over 10 million hits. So that's my you know, not too empirical uh, method of determining that this is, this is important. We're going to need people who are trained to ask these questions. And we're going to need people who are trained to ask these questions in, in a scientific world that is changing extremely rapidly. So could you talk a little bit about how, how you cope personally as a scientist with being on that frontier? Do you think of yourself that way? And further, uh, how? How do you think we are preparing scientists in this country to be able to do the research in these multidisciplinary fields? That's a great question, of the latter one in particular. Uh, I, it has been a privilege for me to have had the career I, I have had. Uh, I have gone to work many, many days thinking, I can't believe how fortunate I am to walk up and down this stairwell with these people on my right and left. It's been very exciting. Uh, but in many ways, this frontier has been with us for a long time. The frontier of, of you know, not understanding the human brain and not even be able to say why you spend a third of your life asleep and you know, not, not being able to say how it is that our visual systems can recognize the differences between two people 
at lightning speed compared to our most sophisticated vision, uh, artificial vision machines backed by tens of thousands of lines of computer code. Uh, you know, the, the, the miraculous nature of this brain and the reality that gets created in this brain, it's, it's something that people have marveled about for a long time. The thing that's different now is that the technologies that have just been invented in the last 10 years are so powerful that we are now getting data sets, uh, able to make measurements and get data sets, measure the activity of thousands of neurons simultaneously while an alert animal solves a maze uh, or does some sort of visual discrimination task. And we can actually not only record the activity of those cells, we can get their, their full, potentially where it's within grasp, to get the full map of the circuit that they're a part of and start relating the circuit dynamics to the behavior. It's just astounding. Uh, it, there is, it is truly, a sea change that's going on in neuroscience right now. And it's going to affect the whole field. And as we understand the brain more deeply, it's going to have ripple effects out into how we educate kids. Uh, it's going to have ripples out into the legal profession. It's going to, it's going to affect how we uh, think about personal responsibility and personal ethics. Um, so I, you know, it's, it's very exciting. And when, when we talk about what's the right preparation for it, I frequently discourage undergraduates from majoring in neuroscience. There, there are some really good undergraduate majors out there, but if they know they want to go to, to get a PhD and do research in this area, that's what they're headed for. You know, I, I say get some uh, deep background in one of these disciplines that's going to contribute in a key way to the future of brain research. Get, uh, you know, heavy in math and statistics and probability. Get a physics degree, get a chemistry degree, because chemistry is contributing uh, greatly to the study of the brain. Maybe a psychology degree so that you're really steeped in quantitative measurements and analysis of behavior. Because nervous systems evolved to produce behavior. They didn't evolve to make interesting molecules. Uh, <laughs> as much as the molecular <laughs> biologists think, think, think it's different. So I, you know, I like to see undergraduates, if they're gonna major in neuroscience, get a strong double major in another one of the allied disciplines. Some of the very best ones coming to us now for graduate school actually come from engineering. They're people who understand signal processing at a very deep level and the mathematical techniques that you apply to signals because this is all signals up here. And it's, it's electrochemical signals that we have to measure and understand in extremely sophisticated ones. And theory, you know, bringing linear and nonlinear dynamical systems theory into the study of the brain is gonna just be extraordinarily fruitful, I think, over the next few years. So it's exciting that, that that multidisciplinary education needs to start at the undergraduate level and then you can really focus deeply in, in graduate school. I, I think that's fascinating because there are so many different ways of knowing. And I, I remember as an undergraduate psychology major and as a PhD student in psychology in my early career with colleagues uh, in other disciplines, I was always astounded that as a psychology major, I actually had the best grasp on the empirical method because you're controlling situations that are much harder to control when you're working directly with human beings than you are um, with most other organisms, although not all other organisms. And um, we talked, as you can tell, prior to this. So Bill has a little bit of an idea of what I'm going to ask, but I'm gonna ask a question that just stemmed directly from what you said that you're not expecting, and I'm a thousand percent sure that you can answer this. Um, you work with a primate species, you often work with macaques, and in, to do that in today's world, you have to have an extremely um, rich ethical sense, and you have to be able to ethically defend your research in a world with social media, um, where primate research particularly is just a volatile issue in and of its own right. Can you talk a little bit about how your interdisciplinary knowledge or your cross multidisciplinary knowledge has prepared you to do that? Oh, that's a, that's a really <laughs> good question. I did not know Marianne <laughs> was going to ask this one. Um, so, you know, in many ways, I had to work that out for myself, Marianne. I mean, I was a physics major. I didn't touch organisms really as an undergraduate. And when I went to Caltech to do a PhD in neuroscience, I had to study nerve muscle coordination and I had to dissect living nerve and muscles out of frogs, you know, and I, I had never, I had never euthanized or killed an animal in my life, and that was a very difficult step to take. And I had to just kind of reason through that, you know, when you, when you do that, when you take a life, um, are you eating a frog's life or, you know, a drosophila life or something? I mean, you're taking something of value 
and you'd better be damn sure you thought really hard and you're going to get something of value back, not only for people, but for veterinary medicine and ultimately for animals as well. Now, primates are difficult uh, and, and rise, arouse a lot of passions. I'm sure we could get into a very impassioned discussion about it right here. Um, but I, I made the judgment that there were certain things we could learn about in primates and certain things that were important about the primate brain and primate neurobiology that we really needed to learn. Uh, and we would try to learn this in awake, alert animals, you know, who, who could in principle, there's nothing we were doing about our procedures that were in principle damaging to them and we could go on for months or years and trying to do it where the animal is uh, well adjusted and calm in its environment because the animal's not gonna come play the video game. Basically the animals play video games to tell us what they're seeing or to explore motor movements or something like that. Uh, so we try, I mean, we're heavily regulated, obviously, and labs inspected all the time, but we try to go beyond the regulations, and we try just just in some selfish sense, in a, uh, you know, that we're knowing we're going to get the best behavioral data if the animal is calm and adjust, well-adjusted in the situation and cooperating with us. So the, you know, the ethics of it are, are you know, difficult, and there are legitimate arguments to be made on both sides of this thing. And I've just tried to steer as ethical a course as I can, being responsible to the animals, uh, but being responsible to our society and building the intellectual capital we need about primate uh, nervous system and the primate brain that I think are going to unlock a lot of the secrets to understanding the human brain. Thank you. I, um, it, it inspires great confidence, your response. And I, what drew me to that question was, it's very clear to me from everything you've said that you, you have given a lot of thought to pretty much everything um, that impinges on what you do. Um, one thing we also talked about is, for a moment, stepping back from Bill Newsom, the scientist, um, the physicist, the biologist, the neuroscientist, but you as a person. And we talked a little bit about how your education, and particularly your liberal arts education, prepared you to be a good citizen, generally, um, both within and outside the academy, in your community, for example. Can you tell us a little bit about your life beyond yeah. your work? Um, it, yeah, yes. Now, Stetson was really formative for me in ways that went far beyond the intellectual. I mean, uh, it was uh, picking up on something Gregory said today. It was really cool that at Stetson, some of the, unlike my high school, uh, some of the young women actually liked smart guys. <laughs> and that, was, that was a big change from my high school. That was great. So I, st I got to explore that world a bit. Um, but you know, part of training in science and doing scientific pr presentations, or really any good academic presentations, is you open yourself to criticism from your peers, right? That's one of the best things we do for each other. We keep each other honest and we poke holes in each other's arguments and we look at the quality of the evidence. And in you know, many real world situations, you have to make decisions based on very shaky evidence. And how do you do decision making uncertainty and uh, under in certain conditions of uncertainty is important. And I can tell you one story, Marianne, where this really affected my citizenship. I moved into a neighborhood in Woodside, California about 15 years ago. And one of the very first things that happened to me, I got recruited to be on this water board, this little water company, you know, that was 40 households, including You just mine. said you got recruited to be on a water board. Water board, a water board. <laughs> it's, it's a little water company of 40 people. And, and this, it was all volunteer by the residents. And I got on there and I was wondering, what the hell am I doing on this water board? There's, there, Ernie, with the president, he, he knew all the pumps and pipes, where all the pipes went. Uh, there was a, guy, a woman there who was a legal assistant, and she had the legal stuff covered. There was a guy there who was a VC guy, and he had finances covered. And, and I couldn't figure out, oh, there was a guy who there who was a systems engineer from, from the NASA outfit down at Moffett Field. And so I could see what he was doing. I had no idea what I was doing. I felt like I was kind of a fifth wheel or something. But we were in a very contentious situation where this little water system was falling apart. It had been maintained by vol volunteers on the hill for you know 50 years. And these two guys who knew the system were in their 70s. And they could move off to Arizona for their health at any time. Uh, and nobody would be left to do this. We had to sell ourselves. We, we couldn't sell ourselves. We had to pay a larger company to take us over. We had to pay a lot of money for that because the system was in poor shape. And it was a very political thing on that hill and people were very, very angry. 
And the very first shareholders meeting that we had uh, where we were delivering this bad news, the president, you know, the crusty old pumps and pipes guy, was, was uh, up there leading the meeting. We had helped him put a few slides together. And uh, it just dissolved. The meeting went to hell in a handbasket. And people were angry, and they started yelling. And he started yelling back. And I was running the slide projector. I had to, I had to stand up and take over the meeting. Okay? I, I said, already, let me handle this, please. And I was sitting there, and, and I was dealing with critical questions. How do you know this? How do you know this? What do you mean this? Where did that number come from? And I felt like I was in a science seminar. Okay. <laughs> uh, and I sort of became the de facto political leader. And I was out in people's homes, sitting in their living rooms. I was reminded of Tip O'Neill, all politics is local, right? And you, you get the votes. Lyndon Baines Johnson in the United States Senate getting the votes one at a time, you know, grabbing the lapels of, of, of one of his colleagues. And I was doing all this stuff as though I didn't have enough to do in my day job, right? <laughs> Uh, but it worked. It worked out in the end, and I had came, came time to make the big presentation where the vote. We were really coming down to the vote, and I told the water board. This is in about 2005. This is uh, after we had invaded Iraq, and after it was obvious there were no WMDs in Iraq. And um, I told the water board, "All right, guys, I'm willing to stand up and make this presentation, but I'm not an expert on these things, and I'm relying on you for intelligence. I will play." You're Colin Powell at the UN, but I want to be sure this intelligence is better than what he had. <laughs> there I am. I'm being a citizen. I was I was totally. crazy to get involved in that. But it, it, I, you may have a, an additional career as a consultant to several of the college and university presidents in here who are dealing with uh, very ancient steam systems and things on their campuses. I think that uh, I'm looking for. Right. It might be time for us to transition to some questions from the audience, but before we do, I just want to thank you. Thank you for uh, thinking about this and taking it so seriously and tailoring um, your answers to a way that would be meaningful for this audience. I very much appreciate it. It's a pleasure. That. As you can tell, uh, my heart, even though I've been at Stanford for close to 30 years now, my heart, uh, much of my heart is in the kinds of work that people, they're done by people in this room and in the small uh, arts and sciences colleges all around this country that gave me so much and continue to give America's students so much. Thank you so much. Um, and, and you inspired me, Bill. I, I came up with it. I'm standing here, by the way, because the video guy said I need to be in some light. I don't know if this helps any, but it's good. So, as they said, I have a face made for radio. But um, <laughs> you inspired at least one joke, because when you talked about being able to step back and see a larger picture than just this level of molecular biology or neuro, whatever it is, it occurred to me that one way of putting the argument is that um, there's an old saying that to a hammer, everything looks like a nail, but not if the hammer has been to a small liberal arts college. <laughs> Uh, okay, questions, please. And we have folks on with microphones on both both aisles. Yes. Yes, right here. And please identify yourself. Sure. Good morning, Katie Convoy, Provost at Simmons College in Boston. Um, a few years ago, I uh, learned about a writer who I thought was just fascinating. This is just a little preamble to my real question. Andrea Barrett, wonderful fiction writer, writes about 19th century science, and her um, collection of short stories, Ship. Fever won the National Book Award. And I had this experience of like driving down the road on the way to work and hearing her speak on NPR and pulling over to the side of the road to write her name down because she said this. She said, the thing about uh, 19th century science, which is what she mostly writes about, is that the average educated 20th century person can understand all of 19th century science and actually read most of it in its original. But the average 21st century person can't even understand a fraction of 20th century science. And so I, I guess my question is, as we want to inspire more young people to go into STEM disciplines, how do you have ideas for how in our colleges and universities we help them to think about the fact that what they're doing matters in some broader way than the very specialized even undergraduate research that they may be involved in, where they're working with a faculty member who's working on a very specific topic that might be highly arcane. And yet that student wants to think about this discipline as something that can change the world, can matter. So I'm interested in, in any thinking you may have done about that. 
Yeah, that's a really great question. Uh, and you know, I, I went into it, uh, into science, just because I was fascinated by it. When I, and when I was in junior high school and looked for the first time inside, into a microscope, into what looked to my naked eye like a clear drop of water, but inside that I saw all these little organisms and bugs swimming around, I was hooked. Totally hooked from the first time I looked into a microscope like that. Um, but but this, there's a lot of competition out there for kids' time and attention these days, and especially a lot of drive from families, you know, that we've heard some of it paraphrased here this morning, be sure you have a job when you come out of there. Um, so there's a lot of utilitarian calculus and maybe not enough attention being paid to, you know, how can I really make a difference? How can my particular skills and, and my particular interests make a difference in the world? And, you know, I would, I would just, uh, point out to students, I do point out to students uh, all the time how increasingly science and technology based our, our society is. I mean, you know, within our lifetimes, we're gonna be, we're gonna be putting the job of driving a car, and we're gonna turn that over to computers uh, with, within some of our lifetimes here. Uh, so, I, you know, it is, it is changing the world, and it is incredibly important that we have people who understand science and can talk intelligently about science and, and in all walks of life. We need them in the newspaper business. We need them in government. Uh, we need them in teaching in our, our younger students. We need them in business. I mean, businesses have to make decisions under conditions of uncertainty all the time. And if you don't know how to evaluate the quality of your data and really how to reason about it carefully, um, and what the concept of a control condition or a control experiment, um, your ability to lead the business is, is reduced. Uh, so I think you know, this kind of science education and uh, learning about you know, asking objective questions about how things work and saying how can we get the data about how things work, this is just fundamental to so many walks of life. Uh, and I even tell our PhD students this, the PhD is a choice point. At the end of the PhD, you can go on to postdoctoral research in a, in a career in academic sciences. There are many other careers for you to choose. And we need PhD level scientists in all of those careers. So I, I see science as a starting point. Uh, it'll be a finishing point for some, but there'll be many, many finishing points for people who start down that pathway. And, and science is, is simply critical. And by the way, there's no shortage of people, young people who want to study science. Uh, the deal is that so many of them now are coming from abroad. They're, they're not Americans. I mean, you know, foreign um, students are a majority, have been for some time in schools of engineering in the United States. And that is, that is coming in other STEM disciplines as well. So, um, you know, there are a lot of students out there who see the importance of this and, and where these kinds of skills can take them. But, you know, neither of my kids is in science, so I don't. That, had, that may have had some complex, eatable things. Going on. <laughs> could I? Could I respond? Sure. No, Mary, I'd one love to hear too. your perspective. Um, on this. You know, I think the the um, ubiquitousness, the positive ubiqui ubiquitousness of um, experiential learning and undergraduate research in our institutions is really relevant to this. And I, I just have a cute story that I want to tell. Last year. I mean, I was at a new institution. I was a new president at this institution, and I was trolling around the dining hall about three weeks into the semester. And I saw a group of students who I knew to be first year students because I had helped them move their stuff into their dorm rooms a few weeks before. And um, I, I went around the table and I said, tell me about your first semester. And they all had incredibly wonderful things to say, but one said, um, well, I'm working on a cure for Alzheimer's. <laughs> and I, said, oh, uh, that's really great, tell me about it. And he proceeded to say that on his first day, um, when the first day of classes, he went around and knocked on the doors of all the professors in the science department to see whose research he found most interesting. And we have a program of retired returning scholars, um, research scientists emeriti, and they're working on real problems in the real world many of which they brought with them from the drug companies that they had worked for or um, in, in any other uh, scientific research facilities that they had worked for. And it turned out this, this young man, indeed, three weeks after he started, was working on a cure for Alzheimer's. Now, he put that in a very broad way, but the point that I want to make is that 
one of the things that we try to do at liberal arts colleges, and despite the fact that you didn't do specifically undergraduate research, I'm sure you experienced at Stetson, is to provide um, very quick and uh, often experiences that can relate to the world outside the academy or the world outside the classroom or you know, the, the applied world or the meaningful world. And I think ultimately that's how we're going to be able to do it, particularly for students in liberal arts colleges who come in not having declared a major in many of our institutions, they can't declare a major on the first day in the door. So by definition, they have to seek out these experiences. And the more we can make them be hooked to um, something that does have meaning for them at that time, I think the closer we can get to that reality. Yeah, Stetson, uh, Stetson does a very good job of this in uh, water resources. Uh, you know, the state of Florida, its population has almost quintupled since I left there after college. Uh, and water resources under great pressure, pollution from agriculture is a big deal. And Stetson undergraduates now, uh, the freshmen get involved in going out on boats and collecting water samples and bringing them back and analyzing them in the chemistry department. And it's, you know, it's something that directly is directly relevant to the lives of Floridians. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a it's these programs are wonderful. I'm so glad this is being recorded. I don't know if this is on or um, because um, just the succinct way you said you kind of recounted the value of those kinds of questions of control experiment of the scientific method to newspapers and busy. Next time, add the arts because <laughs> I mean it. You, okay. you can't. I talked about lighting a show, but I mean, you, you, you can't, I don't think you can make a painting that's good. And, and again, it's about the level of thinking. You can make a painting, but if you want to really make something great, and you want to make a great show, you, you have to be able to ask those questions in those, in those ways, and you need science. Might be a good topic for a future CIC panel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and vice versa, I mean, I think scientists, um, uh, as you mentioned, you know, benefit from studying the arts, and not only STEM, but as some of us are now, dr it's drummed into us to say STEAM, which is, I'm uh, adding the A for arts in there. Other questions? Yes, sir. Thank you. Is there a mic? I'm Bill Fox, and I've really enjoyed the discussion. Uh, this will reveal, I think, one of the sessions college presidents have in the question. Uh, there's, a, there's a fourth R in the old formula, and it's, it's called revenue. And uh, Remembering the study Donald Kennedy did about 20 years ago that these kinds of colleges produce more science PhDs than the Ivies and Big Ten and you know R1s combined because I think the quality of the undergraduate experience is so superior. Uh, it's a very expensive form of education. It's a big part of our operating budgets. Um, it's it's um, meanwhile in a context where funding for NIH is being cut dramatically. So what chance do we have if we're doing something that really contributes to national security and preparing people for this kind of important career, uh, we're feeling a, a, a particular squeeze on cost because it's a lot more expensive to build an organic chemistry lab than to provide a seminar table for British metaphysical poetry. So your comments about that hope for reconciliation that we get greater support in these terms. Yeah, well, one, one I feel your pain. Uh, two, I wish I had an easy answer and I don't. Uh, the fiscal realities and the gridlock in this city is what it is and the real purchasing uh, value of NIH's budget has declined by 20% over the last 10 years. That's real pain. And that, that is just, uh, we're not going to stay an advanced sort of top the line science country with those kinds of real cuts over time and NSF budget, NIH budget, other research. I mean, a lot of research budgets have, have grown inside the military and DARPA certainly does a lot of good stuff, but not in undergraduate education, they don't. The Howard Hughes Medical Institute, I'm, I'm an HHMI investigator, but Howard Hughes has a really good undergraduate uh, uh, program. They actually pay the salaries of excellent undergraduate teachers. They have this, this fellows program and they will fund new courses with an equipment budget in it. Uh, that's one source that I know. But you know, it's, it's trouble if for basic stuff like this, the basic education in the sciences, 
if our nation has to depend more and more and more on philanthropy rather than a committed, um, a committed investment on behalf of the nation from Congress, it's it's a it's a real it's a real red flag, uh, and many of us are concerned about it. Thanks. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. Karen Erickson, uh, Arts and Sciences Dean at Southern New Hampshire University. Uh, <clears throat> just looking at the potential of neuroscience, for example, and looking at the meaning for um, getting enrollments in our colleges five years down the line. Um, the potential for neuroscience, I think, is illustrated in the lead story of foreign policy this month, foreign policy preeminent journal for America's role in the world. The lead story is the neural wars, uh, shortcutting that, reading Putin's mind, or whatever. Uh, it, it presents all sorts of possibilities for other areas of the arts and sciences, uh, but based in neuroscience. So how do we project, let's say, five years down the line, um, those kinds of programs that we will need to be looking at uh, that will be in demand that students are going to need to know, are going to need to have this knowledge to be adapting to the emerging world. Uh, for example, we have a small uh, minor in encryption technology, which is something that uh, the math department is offering. It's a way to get math majors because they'll be interested in encryption technology and then maybe go to the, the uh, mother road. But uh, we, you know, how do you project those you know, five years from now, what will be that need, which will help us to become more relevant and more essential as liberal arts colleges in our role um, in uh, the development of our social, social and economic needs. Yeah, yeah, another great question. Um, you know, the encryption thing is, is actually interesting because there's a lot of encrypted information up here. Uh, and, and I could see hiring a math professor who's really working on decoding, uh, de-encrypting the, the signals that are flowing around the brain because they're gonna be basic math algorithms and computer science algorithms that are, that are essential to that. So that's, that's a possible math faculty hire right there at a liberal arts college in my opinion. Um, so I think the main thing is just to keep your eye on these things. I mean, at Stanford, we just, for the first time, the Graduate School of Education just hired a neuroscientist a guy who does human brain imaging uh, in adolescence and looking at people at different reading skills and trying to figure out which parts of the brain are actually involved in learning to read and whether there are any measurements you can make on the brain that are actually predictive of future success and whether there are interventions that you can design that change the behavior and change the brain circuits. Uh, so I, I think you're right that we all need to be looking ahead like this and just trying to anticipate where the, where the disciplines are going. And, you know, where neuroscience can, can plug in. There, there's a lot of neuro hype out there, honestly. I mean, it's, you know, just go look at the books on the brain on, at Amazon or something, it's overwhelming. And uh, some, of it, some of it's hype. So people are putting companies out there, neuro marketing companies that are actually getting lots of customers. Johnson, Johnson, Procter & Gamble, I mean, they're paying these people seven figure fees, you know, to put little devices on the heads of mock customers and, uh, they advertise that by measuring these simple three-point EEGs, they can tell whether your ad or your product cover uh, taps into the memory systems and the attention system and the emotional systems of the human brain. And, I, and you know, I, none of this stuff is published. You say, well, where's the science backing this stuff? And they say, well, that's proprietary. <laughs> uh, so there may be some, there may be none. Uh, you know, the marketplace is the marketplace. Uh, so. I, you know, we, we, we do have to discriminate and we do have to be careful. And I'm not a neuro imperialist, by the way. I don't think neuro is going to conquer the university or anything. I think neuro is going to have really constructive dialogues with many parts of the campus, which, why I'm, which is why I'm director of this Interdisciplinary Neuroscience Institute at Stanford. Uh, but neuro has a lot to learn from educators, from psychologists, from economists. Any, any, any field that takes human behavior seriously and quantifies it and measures it in ways uh, that we can then say, okay, there's a, there's a quantifiable, measurable capacity of the human brain. 
now let's let's look at what lies behind it in the inside the brain. You know, we will co we'll, we're cooperative with with, the, with those fields, and I think those links will continue to grow. Terrific. And we have time for one more question. We're As you guys can see, ready. succinct answers are not part of my repertoire. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. I'm Beth Paul. I am very, uh, very honored, especially today, to be the executive vice president and provost at Stetson University. And you make us incredibly proud. Um, I think we need to talk about the role of faculty in the kind of education that you're talking about, and especially at institutions where uh, we may have a science faculty that is in place for 35 or 40 years. So can you talk with us about uh, ways in which we should be prioritizing faculty development and faculty engagement so that they can remain contemporary and, and uh, stimulate the kind of learning that you're talking about? I don't, you know, there's no, nothing magic. Um, it's all tools that this crowd knows well. Uh, you know, I've been extraordinarily ple pleased to see that, that Stetson has actually hired two or three by now neuroscientists on their faculty, one in biology that I know, Mike King, and one in uh, psychology, Camille. Yeah, and uh, there was another one also. And you know, I ran into them at a Society for Neuroscience meeting. This is my main professional meeting. It's typically 25 to 30,000 people, and I was giving a big lecture. And I saw Camille and this young student, it was a Stetson student. They came up to, you know, Camille wanted to introduce the, the Camille's a faculty member. Camille wanted to introduce the Stetson student to me. But they were at the Society for Neuroscience meeting, and that matters. Somewhere they got travel money. I don't, and the student got travel money. I think it was in New Orleans. And, you know, making money available for people to go um, to professional meetings like this, to go to summer courses where they can refresh their skills. I mean, Woods Hole, Cold Spring Harbor, these laboratories teach summer courses in modern microscopy techniques or in modern molecular biology techniques as pertains to neurobiology, or there's a vision course, you know, for people interested in sensory perception. Um, those kinds of learning experiments are obviously <coughs> sabbatical opportunities to go off and immerse themselves in a lab, and because, um, because that kind of renewal is critical. As you say, it's a 20, 30, 40 year commitment when you hire a faculty member, and um, science changes fast in, in those times. So it's, it's essential to maintain the quality of the faculty by giving them chances to renew their own, their own perspectives and skills. Thank you so much. It's, um, I remember my, my, my first, one of my first lessons uh, when I was, as Georgia mentioned this morning, on the Board of Trustees of her in, and my institution, Kenyon College, was that um, I was on the faculty and curriculum committee and I was gonna get in there and fight for higher salaries. And, but it turned out that a survey of this very talented liberal arts faculty showed that their biggest priority was they just wanted a little bit of money to go to that conference. You know, and, and if indeed liberal arts prepares you for lifelong learning, I think faculty members need to be encouraged to learn lifelong. I, I can't thank you enough. This has been terrific. And I wanna thank so much Marianne Benninger and Bill, uh, uh, no, Bill Newsom, it's not Bill. So thank you both very much, and we're going to get to lunch in a minute.